with that in mind, let me bring my guests. Lenore Newman is the director of the Food and Agriculture Institute at the University of the Fraser Valley in British Columbia in Canada. And she's author of Lost Feast, Culinary Extinction and the Future of Food. And then Mimi Edelman is the owner of I and Me Farm in Orient Point, New York, and co-chair of the Northeast Arc of Taste region for Slow Food USA. And yes, we will explain that Arc of Taste thing soon. Um, welcome both of you, how's it going? Great. Uh, thanks for having us today. Yeah, it's wonderful to have you. Is everyone ready to record? All right, great. I'm going to go to our first question then. Lenore, since um, we're here for the Lost Feast Book Club, you have the honor of the first question. And that question is really just, what's a lost feast you wish you could taste? You, you wrote a book, you traveled around, you heard a lot of stories about species. Like what's what's the big thing that you're like, man, I wish I, I knew what this tasted like. That is a great question. And I think the one that really keeps me up at night is the Roman herb silphium, which grew in North Africa and was a major trade uh, good as both a medicinal and a flavoring. And if you dig into the Roman cookbook, Apicius, Almost every recipe has either silphium or laser, which was a slightly different part of the same plant. It's everywhere. And then it starts to go extinct and people start to bemoan the loss of this amazing, amazing flavor. And um, it's gone. We don't even exactly know what the plant was. And so, yeah, I would love to actually get my hands on some of that to see what all the fuss was about. Sure. Um, Mimi, what are you growing on your farm right now? Well, the soil's a little cold mm -hmm. and our conditions out on the North Fork of Long Island are a little behind everyone else. Uh, we have some cold winds coming through the sound in the bay from both directions. But just this week, we got some of our fingerling potato varieties in, as well as fava beans and sugar snap peas. Mm -hmm. So we're just opening up uh, the field and germinating in our hoop house some of our herbs. That sounds wonderful. Now, Mimi, I know your farm is, you're a former chef, I should have mentioned this as well. And so when you set out to farm, you set out with a very specific mission, uh, which was to provide flavors for restaurants. How does that work? Chefs have become my muse. Um, I had the great privilege of a European apprenticeship uh, with a four-star French chef. Um, I applied for a job as a sous chef, not knowing what it even was. <laughs> and it was way back in the 80s when we were all awakening to the different cultures of food. And I worked with him uh, learning every technique in classic French cuisine and found my way around the kitchen. And as I began my farm, I knew that that relationship really resonated with me. I could understand the environment they work in and the challenges that chefs have are not all that similar to farmers themselves. Mm -hmm. They've become my uh, partners in the farm. We had to pivot for COVID, but each row that is planned in the field is uh, destined for the chef who selected the seed with me during the winter time and is now following the journey to plate. That's lovely. Um, Lenore, going back to, I feel like we need to pose the problem that we're all sort of skirting around right now, which is this loss of culinary, you know, flavor diversity, or that this, if not loss, then threatened status of a lot of the really rich and diverse flavors of foods out there. Um, you know, how, how bad would you say the problem is um, if we're talking about like say fruits and vegetables? Well, it's a big question, and it's definitely one of the challenges of our age. Uh, currently, the food system occupies about half of the non-glaciated surface of the Earth. And yet, we really don't tap what nature has to offer yet. Uh, there's about 50,000 species on Earth that we can eat, mm -hmm. and we've really only ever 
delved into maybe 500 to 1,000 of those, and only a few hundred are really commercially available. And there's only a handful that provide most of the calories on Earth. And we're losing a lot of that natural diversity right across the board. And I mean, this ties into the bigger problems of climate change and um, the other challenges we're facing. But to me, understanding that we have a library of foods and we're basically seeing it burn down is uh, really something that's upsetting to me. And I think it's upsetting to a lot of people. And we need to think about how do we stop that and reverse it? Um, this is a question for either you or Mimi, um, Lenore or, or Mimi. Is it as simple as saying climate change or our eating and cultivating of foods is in fact threatening them? Like what, what are the big problems as you see it? Like what, what makes it hard to save these species? Well, just to start off, and one of the things I touch on in the book a lot is that uh, for the last 60 years or so, one of the driving forces between agri in agriculture is to be to make meat really cheap. And that's it. That's the only variable that was stressed. And the environmental impact of that one part of the chain is massive. So for example, we look at dairy, it covers massive areas that used to be primal forests, that were rainforest, and it's about 3% of the climate change piece just on its own, just for dairy. And we're not talking about small scale, like production of say, really like say Stilton cheese or something like that. 90% of the milk we produce goes into dry powdered milk products. And you have to ask yourself, do we really need that given how much the land base it's covering. And we can say the same for all of the meat categories. Making meat protein cheap and really plentiful has had an enormous cost on animal welfare, on environmental impact. And we need to start turning that around. To me, it's sort of the number one easy, low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Mimi, what do you think? I agree very much with Lenore. Um, we live on a planet where there's great interconnection between living species. We're watching plants and animal species disappearing. And I feel we have a great agricultural lineage in the United States that unfortunately got muddled with modern agriculture, uh, industrial food processing. And I'm going to throw the availability of clean and, and, and life seed. Uh, even the seed industry mm -hmm. is very much compromised. We're living in a, a monoculture where taste isn't part of the equation. It's how quick can we grow it? How can we transport it, give it a good lifestyle? How can it fit into our machines for packaging and processing? So all the sensorial values, the nutritional values in the foods that we should be eating for our health and well-being, along for the health and well-being of our earth, are being overcome by industrialization. And, and I agree, Lenore, that what happens when something, a forest is lost, we all lose. Mimi, why don't you introduce the arc of taste while we're talking about flavor then? No, no, I, 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 was, I should have brought that up sooner. So you're part of this project called the arc of taste, um, which involves saving, as you might imagine, the flavors of species. Um, how does it work? And, and maybe tell us the story about one of the species that is on it right now. The Slow Food Arc of Taste is a global food preservation project. So the entire world is finding the that are at risk of extinction or underappreciated. And gathering the information that we can still find to create a compelling story about this food. This food can have ceremonial, traditional, culinary values um, that you know, tell us the history of food and the history of humanity. You know, you can't talk about food without talking about humanity. 
And the arc of taste, uh, I've, I've had the pleasure with my co-chair, Jeff Quattron. It is Northeast region of the United States is where I seek out these foods. And they can be from land or soil. Uh, they can be wild or cultivated. We even include beverages, spirits, um, products that are following traditional techniques and practices in there. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a lot of favorite foods. You know, when you write about food, I think Lenore will agree with me, you do start thinking about that food and savoring and desiring it so. And um, fortunately, many of the Arc of Taste foods that I have researched and successfully launched on the global Arc of Taste are um, foods that I grow field. So I can have them for breakfast <laughs> and I can trial new ones in my field. Um, I think my favorite story, if you'll indulge me, is Hank's extra special bean. Uh, Hank was a farmer in Ghent, New York in the Hudson Valley. And he noticed in his production of legumes in white beans, uh, for drying, that he couldn't quite capture the flavor and the qualities that he remembered as a boy. When the family's dish was prepared for family occasions and church socials, they were mushy and, and, and lacked those flavor notes, that nuttiness, that creaminess that he remembered. So naturally breeding the best qualities of the beans over generations he found a bean that he truly treasured along with the tradition of the recipe. And Hank passed away and his daughter who helped me write the nomination found a small quantity of the beans in the barn. And she shared them with the Hudson Valley Seed Library, our good friends, Ken Green. And we decided to engage Hudson Valley Seed Library, Glenwood's Agricultural Center, seven chefs and seven farmers throughout the region with the grand responsibility of increasing the inventory of Hank's extra special bean. And I, I'm sorry. Oh no, go ahead. The culmination of this uh, was very, very beautiful. We grew the product, we had the dialogue, the chefs journeyed with us. We all came together at Glenwood to uh, winnow and thresh the beans together. And they were debuted at the Brooklyn Museum of Food and Drink and juried by a very well-known French cassoulet judge. And sure enough, Hank, did us all very proud. And it was absolutely delicious. We just put a little bouquet of herbs in stock, good stock. And sure enough, the creamy, a little dante, a little bite to it. It was all there and held up under slow cooking in this family's recipe. Mimi, that's such a wonderful story. And I feel like it really illustrates, you know, as you mentioned, and as Lenore sort of illustrates throughout her book too, this connection between people and food and story and food. Um, and I want to turn to an audience question because we, we are here to let the audience ask questions about one of my favorite stories, which is that of the passenger pigeon, um, which was like one of the first great extinctions where we can definitely say we ate them to death. <laughs> um, and also it's, it was, you know, this this period where we we as a society had this realization that we had the power to drive animals extinct, right? People weren't quite believing because, you know, there were billions that would fly across the sky and it would take hours for them to pass. Um, and Renoir has a couple questions, I would assume for Lenore, because you wrote about this in your book, but I, a couple questions about the passenger pigeon. So Renoir, uh, whenever you are able to unmute yourself, um, you can go ahead and ask those questions. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I have several questions, two questions about the passenger pigeon. One is, uh, I was reading in the book, um, you know, about how human predation of passenger pigeons 
occurred in the United States mainly. And one of my questions is, were there different methods of human predation, you know, catching the passenger pigeons? Are there, you know, are these culture, culturally bound or are there culture differences in the US, between the US and Canada and how they would catch these pigeons, you know, early on? And I know this is historically, there are historic difference too, differences as well. So if you could just pick a period and compare the two countries, if there, if there is a difference, I would appreciate that. And then I'll follow with the second question. Actually, Renor, Renor, if you're able to ask that second question now, that might be a little oh. simpler. That's OK. OK, that's fine. OK. Uh, do you know a specific tree species that became rarer as a result of the extinction of passenger pigeons? Great. Thank you for those that's questions. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, the first part of the question, it's an interesting one. And if we go back far enough uh, before colonization, it uh, there really was very little difference because, of course, the boundary didn't exist. And uh, some of the most intense uh, harvesting at the time was in the Iroquois Confederacy, and um, uh, primarily netting. And the weird thing is netting was also used extensively uh, once settler culture took hold. And even during the age of sort of the apex of the passenger pigeon, that sort of mid 19th century period of the pigeon hunters who followed the flocks and lived in the field and netted the birds and sent them back in barrels to the great cities. Um, there is a certain whimsical, almost hard to believe nature, but they were very easy to kill. And so you get these weird stories such as um, in Toronto, Canada, because people were tired of everyone shooting pigeons uh, by the flocks would fly over the city and people would literally shoot birds shot straight up, which is a terrible idea, don't do it. And uh, the birds would rain down and there was free dinner. They actually passed a law saying that, uh, that you couldn't do this anymore. And then the first time a flock flew over, all of the members of the RCMP ran outside and started shooting their service revolvers into the air to grab their own dinner. So the law didn't really work. It was, it was a bit of a free for all is the amazing thing. But the main method of, um, of catching the bird was netting, uh, at least to get them in bulk. Um, because the truth is, she, even though they were quite a large bird, um, bird shot did leave a certain amount of damage. The sort of valued bird was the netted bird where you weren't picking out little pellets. Uh, and it was pretty uniform between the two countries because the birds did do this great arc. And uh, ironically, I'm sitting in one of the only parts of North America that didn't have passenger pigeons. Basically, the Rocky Mountains were like a wall. And there were no passenger pigeons on my side, but everywhere on the other side had them. Um, as for the forest, it did change. Um, and I don't have exact details. I mean, I'm not as familiar with uh, the eastern forests as I am my own forest out here. Although I do know in Ontario in particular, the Carolinian forest, the species shifted away from what we call masting trees, you know, the kind of um, the oaks and the trees that had actual acorn into into more of uh, our sugar maple, uh, other Carolinian species. So there was kind of a shift. Um, there also was a shift in animal species as well. I mean, it uh, when you knock out a keystone species that big, it actually does really change the forest dynamics. And we don't even entirely understand how the forest shifted because uh, we didn't if it was happening now, we would take very careful records. We have just sort of these anecdotes of a shift away from masting trees to more broadleaf, and also um, changes in deer population, in other in mice populations. So yeah, everything uh, everything shifted, and and the reason the passenger pigeon was a keystone species is realistically they were the most populous bird in history 
on the planet. There were billions of them. And it was that sheer number that just really changed dynamics. And one of the other changes that happened is when they came and nested, they would nest in, in uh, colonies that covered kilometers. And they would just blast the forest to the ground in their nesting. They would literally break the forest down. They would leave a really fertile patch too uh, because of all of uh, you know, all the guano. And then they'd move on. And so you had these little patches of really intense biodiversity where the pigeons were. And um, yeah, that, that cycle left. One of the other things that some people do uh, believe is that uh, they helped maintain a forest that was slightly less prone to forest fires. And that one of the reasons, I mean, there's a number of reasons we have more forest fires now, but one of them is the loss of this species that did create kind of a little opening patches, broke up the canopy a bit. And um, a number of the groups who would you know, like to see the passenger pigeon come back, and that's a whole other area, do feel there's a forest um, you know, sort of cultivation process. So I hope that uh, covers it. Uh, I think that covers off your questions. Thank you, Lenore, for that. Um, Mimi, I think we have a question that might that you might enjoy tackling. Um, and it's from Sarah, and it's about food commercialization overall, and this idea of like local agriculture and plant and place based planting. Sarah, whenever you're ready to unmute, I think you're ready. Uh, yeah, so my question is a tiny bit nebulous, but it was, do you think the commercialization of place based plants is positive, that's the kind of nebulous part for our world. Um, for example, the relatively recent commercialization of the, the grain quinoa outside of its native Peru, um, or should communities be focused on supporting these plants um, where they are native? Thank you, Sarah. And Mimi, I guess I would add to that too, maybe the question that, um, you know, if we're talking about preserving something in the arc of taste, for example, is the idea that it should become a mass commercial product, uh, like Aunt Molly's ground cherries, or or is it better to have things, you know, less commercialized and more localized? I'm just sorry to hijack your question a little bit, Sarah. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, I'm going to try to answer it the best way that I can. I um. I have a small farm, and I think small farms are real farms. There are places where not only we can embrace biodiversity, um, but we can all, we're also in the position to educate and reach out to our communities and begin our seed saving practices, as well as I'm an organic biodynamic farmer. So my stewardship um, is very centered on finding my rightful place uh, amongst the life cycle of the farm. When you grow a plant like Hank, let's use Hank as an example in Ghent, New York, and you save that most vital seed from the mother plants, that seed is going to be most adaptable for most regions in New York. So when you close the cycle and create a very robust resource for seed and harvest, I think you play a very important role in introducing these foods that are at risk. And I think a couple of questions that kind of go together about the role of technology. Uh, one is a comment uh, from someone anonymous. Uh, Lenore, we interviewed you for the show last week and you mentioned, um, and I apologize again for the terrible pun, but we talked about how bullish you are about meat replacement via like cellular agriculture. Um, and this anonymous person wants to know if you could talk a little bit more about why it's so important to cut down on the consumption of animals and animal products um, for climate, for example. Um, and then Rebecca has a, a sort of related question I guess these two are different actually, but but we'll talk about, we can talk about cellular agriculture as a solution. And then also Rebecca has a question about genome editing um, and whether the, actually Rebecca, come on, ask your question yourself, sorry. 
Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. So I know they're they're a little bit different of spheres, right? But I, I'm imagining a world of an equilibrium, right? So I kind of want to know what you think about the generation of new species through genetic engineering and genome editing, keeping up with the rate of culinary extinction and what factors kind of help determine the rate of change on both sides of that equation. Yes, and uh, I mean, it's a fascinating question, and we probably could spend an hour on that. And uh, I realize I'm a bit of an odd duck in that uh, I kind of sit on both sides in that uh, part of my work is really understanding the long arc of technology. And to me, pretty well everything we do in agriculture is a technology. And I often use the example of a cow because cows are not natural, if that word means anything. They're uh, bred out of a creature called the auroch, which went extinct in Poland uh, a few hundred years ago. And um, if we look at the cow as a piece of technology, it wasn't great for mass production. Now it's fine if you have a few cows, but it's a megafauna. There were never supposed to be this many cows. And the purpose of the cow largely now is to produce really cheap milk and really cheap hamburger. And in the US, about 70% of beef produced goes into just hamburger, which boggles my mind every time I think about it. And if we really look at, uh, at these problems, we have to say, okay, well, what can these ne new technologies do for us? And I sometimes think that gene editing in particular, especially around new technologies like CRISPR, gets a bit of a bad rap because it's a little scary, but then crossbreeding is basically the same thing. It's like very fast crossbreeding. Um, so I'm in favor, but what I always say and the proviso I always give, I'm, I'm a true believer there's no such thing as a bad technology. I also believe there's never been a technology we haven't used, but where you must, must work is on the policy side. That policy is what puts a ring around the technologies you're using. And that goes from everything, from an iron plow to, you know, the first time we bred, interbred two species, like a strawberry is both a uh, North American and, um, a European crossbreed, but it's you need the policy. And the problem is our policy environment has been about profit for a very long time now. It has not been about environment. It has not been about animal ethics. It's certainly not been about health, not in the US, not, not in Canada. And we've worked really hard to make sure people eat a lot of meat, much more than we actually need, and a lot of carbs, like really a lot of carbs, both sugars and grains. And poor old vegetables. If and you know, if you're a vegetable farmer in this world, no one loves you in Washington or Ottawa. No one's ever said, you know, the broccoli guys, they need something. It's got to come down to policy, and that isn't particularly true with these genetic technologies. And I think the one thing I worry about, we're not, we're not quite as mature as one would like to have the kind of technology we do now. The the fact we can blow the planet up or radically change genomes, it, it does get a little scary when you think about the kind of things that we're still embroiled in. And the truth is genetic technologies in particular require a really good policy environment in which everyone is working together and saying, look, the goal has to be environment, health, making sure we're not all killing each other. and so yeah, I, I'm not going to say I don't wake up in the middle of the night sometimes. The first time I learned about gene drives, I didn't sleep for about four days. But you know, I also can sit there and think, huh, you know, I could see that being good as long as people aren't totally evil about it. So that's partly why I work so heavily in policy and why I advise governments on policy is to me, without that policy, you can do a lot of damage with, you can do damage with herding animals. And we are, believe me. And you can do damage with genetics. And the trick is making sure we're living in a world where the herding animals and the genetics can't end up with us all sitting in a smoking wasteland. Thank you, Lenore, for weaving together two questions that I didn't think were related, but you somehow made that happen. So thank you. Um, 
Mimi. So one of the one of the questions I have for you is just um, it feels like it can be very like I want to say vogue, but the idea of you know we're eating local, we're eating from small farms, we're eating organic. Uh, the food industry is starting to use these terms as selling points. And how do you feel? What do you think about how? those are being used and whether they actually sort of reflect honestly the value um, and the meaning of the food that we're consuming. You know, is, or, is it enough to just say, well, I'm just gonna eat organic and local and now I'm fine, I'm, I'm doing my part. I, I guess I've been growing uh, vegetables food for long enough to move through the food movement, trailblazing it along the way. And I found just within my short career that words like organic or free range, grass fed, they, were, they had a truth to them, of authenticity to them. But now they've become a trend, a marketing, a, a, a highlight that I'm afraid that the consumer can't fully trust. And I feel the only way, and this is how I eat and navigate my local food shed is I meet the growers. You go out to the dairy farm and you see how they're ma managing their pasture and providing these wonderful greens for them to eat, which will re reflect in the fresh taste of their milk. You go and see the poultry, uh, the little quails. A friend of mine is a heirloom poultry farmer and you watch how these quails live in their natural environment with little shelter out in the grasses. When someone comes, whether it's a chef or a consumer to me, I invite them to my farm and we walk together and taste together. And that is the best way to make your choices, not necessarily by the language that is on the uh, package, but in the relationship with the farmer, because the consumer plays a very vital role in all of the issues that we're talking about today. I think we have maybe time for one, maybe, maybe two more questions. Um, but I think like when we start looking towards like what, what can people do? And, you know, not necessarily everyone can go meet their farmer depending on where they live and, and their economic circumstances. Um, but Carol has a question about something I know I've seen a lot of uh, myself and um, the Portland, someone in the comments, the Portlandia chicken farm episode, you know, did this chicken have a good life? What was her favorite color? Can we go see the farm? Um, but yeah, Car Carol has a question about something I, I know I have seen a lot of lately, which is these misfit fruits and veggies. And I feel like this is going to be a question for both of you. But um, Carol, why don't you go ahead and ask that question? I don't see you showing up yet. Carol, can you unmute? Um, oh, she can't join via voice. I'm asking on Carol's behalf. So Carol is wanting to know just is the marketing of ugly fruits and vegetables helping steer people to buy for flavor instead of just appearance? Um, and, and is this like a marketing tool perhaps that can get people to be, again, like eating more for flavor and the, the value of the food as opposed to how it looks? Um, and Mimi, if you want to start with that and Lenore, if you want to follow up. I ordered one of those misfit boxes. Um, I was very, very curious. I, I think we're all concerned about food waste. And there is a lot of very good, lively food. Um, they might be a little tarnished, a little bruised, a little overripe, but they still have a place in our food preparation. They can be absolutely delicious. And I think that's what um, the arc of taste, for example, some of these fruits and vegetables aren't the most handsome. Uh, you look at a hard cider apple and they have tremendous irregularities and blotches. But if you bite into that apple, it's the crispiest, most moist uh, essence of what an apple should taste like. So I think we can't judge by perfection, the perfection that we see on the shelves. And we shouldn't let anything 
and our food preparation go to waste. When we're selling our Parisian carrots at the farm stand, we encourage them like their grandmothers would to take the greens. And if you don't have chickens, make pesto. There's no reason to waste. And if there is residue from cooking or from your garden, donate it to a food pantry or put it in your compost pile, start a compost pile. Nothing should go to waste. What about you, Lenore? Yeah, I certainly agree. And I think once again, it is also, there's a policy element that we're missing in North America still. And the example I often give, I was on a task force um, advising the government on moving ahead with uh, better processing and such. And we turned a cherry facility in the Okanagan here in British Columbia. It's a big cherry growing region. And the producer had really good equipment. It was um, an excellent facility. And 10% of the crop got skimmed off and sent to China right away because they wanted, they'll only take the very top. The next 40% went to the domestic market and they were totally fine, looked good to me. 50% of the cherries, for whatever reason, didn't quite meet that market bar. And so what they were doing with them was landfilling them. And I was like, what on earth are you doing? And the farmer explained to me, he's like, look, it's the only economic thing I can do with this fruit. I hate it. I really want to do something with it. And there happened to be a juice factory just down the road. And the, the you know, naive were, were advising the government, we're like, why aren't you selling them to the juice factory? It turns out the juice factory only buys concentrate from China. And so we threw our hands up and we actually made some noise on the government side saying, you got to do something about this. This this guy is doing what the market is telling him to do, and it's awful. It makes him feel bad. He He's paying to have the cherries picked because they're being thrown out post-production. And to me, the fact that that's the right answer, that that's what the system is telling people to do, it, it's, it's insanity. And I really think we have to start on a system-wide level asking questions. How do we make sure we're not just wasting input, wasting labor? It, I don't know. I still, wake, I still wake up in the night and think, dang, those cherries. Give them to me. I'll do something with them. But uh, yeah, and uh, you know, that's one example of thousands across North America. And we have to get a handle on that. And it's above the individual. Because I mean, definitely individuals can do a lot on food waste but there's about half of food waste that's baked into the system and we have to take it on. And that needs governments that actually have some spine and are willing to come out and say, no, we can't be throwing away food. So I think we have one last listener question and it's from Casey. And I think it tacks on really nicely to the question I was going to ask you both anyway, which is what else can we individuals do um, that, you know, if we value flavor, if we value biodiversity and, you know, we value the intersection of those two things, like what can we do to help um, keep that alive in the world? Um, and Casey, I know you had a slightly different question, but again, I feel like it fits. So if you want to go ahead and ask that question. Um, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, so I, I guess my, my thought was, I mean, we're, we're talking about all, um, earlier you're talking about all these species that are not being tapped into. I mean, that we have all these edible food out there, but we're not actually tapping into it. And it, it's actually, it's interesting that I realize I'm expanding this, but it seems like with people, there's, there's these two things that are going on. We have uh, one, we want to be comfortable, right? We want to eat food that we feel comfortable with. Um, but on the other hand, we also want variety. And uh, that's why we want to try things international. But actually, that's kind of interesting because it seems like we don't want to try something that we don't really know what it is <laughs> a lot of the times, though, too. It's like we want it to be different, but we also want to have heard that it's OK, <laughs> you know, that, that we can be comfortable with this difference. Um, and so I guess I was wondering um, if, you know, uh, this, this, this desire to have this variety could somewhat be 
um, filled by expanding just the food that we have in our local region by, you know, chefs trying to introduce and us trying to explore the local region foods um, versus this idea that we're actually shipping foods all across the globe, um, you know, so that we can try something new, even though it's well established from some other place, um, which is also obviously not maybe the uh, most environmentally friendly thing to do. And what, what, what are your thoughts on that? So, uh, Lenore, if you want to start with that, um, eating, yeah. eating local foods, but also anything else you want to advise people to do. I have three recommendations that I give everyone. And number one is exactly in line with uh, what you're saying. And that is support farmers that are working outside the box, be they small, be, them, be they local, or if they're bigger, but if they're providing you something new that's a little challenging, it's a little more expensive, support them. Because right now we live in a capitalist world. It's what ultimately drives this. They're, they may love it, but they can't work for free. So go to the restaurants that you may pay an extra dollar to for the strange variety. <laughs> go to the farmers who are producing because ultimately they need us to keep doing this. If we all say, oh no, we're fine with big box strawberries that don't taste like anything. Well, you know what? That's what the system will give us. And number two, I really do tell everyone to eat less meat. It is the single biggest thing you can do for climate change, bar none. And uh, as someone, and I like to say, I'm not a shrink and violet. I grew up on a fish boat. I grew up in this industry and my work keeps me, you know, it brings me into factory farms, like the kind that, you know, haunt our dreams. And I've walked their halls. I've talked to the people that run them. To change that system, we have to make choices. So yeah, buy the expensive chicken or take a break from chicken that day. Um, the last thing I do like to tell people is we need the bees. And this might seem like a weird aside, but um, don't use chemicals that kill bees. And if you have any kind of land or balcony, put out flowers bees-like. If you've ever wanted a hive of bees, for crying out loud, start one. It's a really good idea and uh, might not work so well in the apartment, but hey, it's like having thousands of small friends. It's wonderful. And I think these three things are the biggest things people can do. And I'll pass it over to, to Mimi here. Well, I agree with lots of those points. And thanks so much for the shout out to small farmers. <laughs> I, I think that the consumer uh, should open their palates um, there may be foods that they have savored in the past that were disappointing. You know, revisiting them when they're truly seasonal and picked <clears throat> ripely and at the appropriate size and moment in time to revisit those foods. Begin to wander into food history and indigenous foods, wild foods and begin to get those flavor notes um, that you so desire. Uh, chefs are great trailblazers in bringing those flavors forth, but you don't need to be a chef when something is from my hand to yours. It can be simply grilled or eaten raw. So, you know, be be experimental, be open to the uglies, the, the fruits and vegetables that might look a little strange. I go back to developing that relationship with your fishmonger, your cheesemonger, you know, your food provider. Ask them how to prepare it, how they like to prepare it. And um, I have to revisit the dandelion because right now in my neck of the woods, it is dandelion season. And dandelions in biodynamics as, as many very powerful plants are a very welcome sign that spring has arrived. And it's this incredible spring tonic of health and nutrition. They're absolutely delicious, whether it's the root, the leaf, the flower, and how essential that flower is for our early pollinators. 
both wild and kept in colonies. So we go back, I think, to the interconnectedness of things that by leaving that dandelion alone, um, I've got something to eat in my salad or, or dress my pizza with. I have something that is adding nutrition to my soil because as I mulch before they go to seed, I use that same rich nourishment that they provide us to restore the soil. Mimi, thank you so much for that. We are out of time. I'm so, I, I, this was beautiful and lovely and we already went over. Thank you everyone for sticking with us. This was wonderful. Um, and I wanna thank both my guests. So Lenore Newman again is director of the Food and Agriculture Institute at the University of the Fraser Valley in British Columbia, Canada and author of The Lost Feast, or Lost Feast, no the, Culinary Extinction and the Future of Food. And Mimi Edelman is a former chef and current farmer, owner of I and Me Farm in Orient Point, New York and co-chair of the Northeast Arc of Region, uh, Northeast Arc of Taste region for Slow Food USA. Thank you both so much. Thank you.